Hello, and thank you for dialing into this live webinar, Your Questions Answered. I'm Stuart Heggie, and today I'm joined by the managers, Tom Slater and Lawrence Burns. Now, we've been hosting these webinars on a six monthly cycle, and their purpose is for Tom and Lawrence to answer your questions and for them to be shared with a wider audience. Now, today I'm going to begin by asking some of the questions that you've sent in advance, and thank you to those of you that did. However, if you've not yet asked a question and you'd like to do so, the Q&A function uh, should be open at the bottom of your screen. Finally, this webinar is scheduled to take around 45 minutes. If we do have lots of questions at that point, I think we'll go beyond that mark, but we'll give it a hard stop on the hour. So great, well, let's get to it. Uh, Tom and Lawrence, I was, I was reviewing some of the questions that we received and people seem to be curious to know how you allocate your time and to what extent it's been influenced by the recent fall in the share price. So I suppose we last sat down six months ago. Can you just tell us a little bit about how you've spent your time since then? Lawrence, would you like to go first? Sure. I think the key role as an investor is really about learning. Um, yeah. And that doesn't change irrespective of what market environment you happen to find yourself in. And I think in some ways there's two buckets if you sort of talk about the, the day in the life of, of different types of learning. The first one is, is perhaps a rather boring one. It's about sitting down, reading company reports, reading information, learning, reading books, and just trying to understand uh, what is going on in our companies and in the world. And if you ever visit Bailey Gifford, you'll see that our investment floor is often compared to a library. Um, the second slightly more sort of uh, interesting one is really about learning from other people and getting out in the world, meeting interesting people, having conversations and, and, and learning that way. Uh, so we're not just reliant on uh, learning at the desk. And so you said the last six months, over that last six month period, there's been a lot of traveling for both of us of going out and meeting company holdings and people we think can teach us more about what's going on in the world. Um, myself and Tom went to China for two weeks in May. Um, a few months ago, I was in Europe visiting the founders of uh, Spotify, Delivery Heroes, Orlando, HelloFresh. And I think it's the combination of those two forms of learning that end up um, you know, taking the majority of our time as investors. Hmm. Tom, yourself? Um, I, th I think Lawrence captured it pretty yeah. well. Um, I think the, you know, one of the most useful inputs is spending time with hmm. the, the people that, that run and founded the companies we own. Um, you know, some of some some of those individuals are geniuses, and mm. and we're definitely not. Mm. Um, just picking up the the insights that they have to share with us, translating that into what you do in the portfolio is is really helpful. And we're in a really privileged position, I think. In you know, as you rightly said, they're, they're geniuses, so the insights that we we get are, are really very <clears> valuable. Um, and I think it builds a lot of the time on Billy's reputation that we have that access, um, and it's it's a really important input for the fund. Yeah, on these investment trips, uh, I'm not sure how much we've actually shared about. It those in the past but um you know who do you go on them with how are they organized and, and you know i suppose how do they ultimately translate into investment decisions within the portfolio well i, I would say that um you know, what's what's really important is to have a clear well understood philosophy mm -hmm. framework yeah. for, for thinking about investments um but then it's not really very valuable for lawrence and i to sit together all the time and chat yeah. You know, what, what what's valuable is for us to go off and do different things, meet different people, get different sources of information, and then come back together and and try and generate insight from those from, from those different experiences. Um, tr um, tr trips for me um, mostly done done on my own, mm -hmm. um, and you know it's 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 just going from company to company. It's it's you know shoe leather really. Um, you know that and and you I just think you get such a a much more rich experience from from actually visiting companies on their on their on, on their own territory, mm -hmm. actually seeing what operates, seeing what makes those businesses tick. You, know, you can you can go to conferences and see hundreds of businesses over the course of a week, um, but if there's thousands of other people doing that and you, you're just swallowing the bullet points that that yeah. those companies want to to promote, then the chances that you'll generate differentiated differentiated insight are, are close to zero. Well, um, moving moving on, we've all, we've had some questions from shareholders who invested when the share the share when the share price was higher uh, than it currently is uh, right now. So I'm just going to take one of those um, as it was written. Uh, the share price has fallen, and you remain invested in many of the same companies. 
Therefore, we need their share prices to recover or exceed previous highs. What gives you the confidence that they will do so? I'll move to you, Tom. Um, yeah, so you know, the, I guess the, the, the starting point of the question that you sort of invested in most of the same companies that you were <clears throat> will be true whether the stock price had gone up or the stock price had, has gone down because you know, the, the, the essence of what we do is that we're very long term, that you shouldn't expect radical change in, in the lineup in the portfolio. You know, all the time we're evaluating new ideas, we're comparing them to what we own, um, but but we, we we change our minds only very slowly about about you know where we think the best opportunities lie, um, and you know, I, I think um, the, the fundamental point is that over the very long run, stock prices follow earnings of business. Yeah, um, and what what we have had over the past two or three years, and you say this with the benefit of hindsight, is that those stock prices ran ahead of the fundamentals because of what was happening to interest rates. Um, um, but actually, in terms of the operational performances of those businesses, um, by and large, they've been really pretty robust, pretty impressive. Mm. Um, and so you've you've had some of the, the, the valuation premium come out of those stocks. Um, but actually, there's nothing that's really changed in the, in the majority of those investment cases. Um, so you know, we, we don't like inflicting this type of volatility on our <coughs> shareholders. Um, but we see very little to change our minds on the long run competitive advantages and opportunities that those businesses are going after. Mm. Well, we should perhaps talk about some of your higher uh, higher conviction holdings, the larger holdings. Lawrence, perhaps uh, one for you. Uh, Moderna is is a large and high conviction holding in light of recent share price performance. Why is why so? Well, it's it's been an interesting time with Moderna, but I think it also offering us still. Um, the opportunity to own a once-in-a-generation healthcare platform. Mm. Um, and we've talked about this a lot in terms of, you know, what is mRNA? It's a code that allows your body um, to sort of design various different proteins. And the opportunity there, uh, given so much is made of proteins, is very, very wide. And then when you look at Moderna's pipeline, you can see some of that breadth. Uh, yes, it's been very successful in COVID, but you also have its flu vaccine, which it's got good results for. RSV, another respiratory disease for which um, there hasn't previously been a commercially available vaccine, um, and also some of the success that they've had within the personalised cancer vaccine, sort of cutting death rates by nearly half. Um, and it's that broader platform that really interests us rather than what is an endemic steady state market for COVID. Mm. Um, and the value of that, um, I think, is something that is really being ignored at this point by the market. You're looking at Moderna being a $25 billion company. It's got about $15 billion of cash, which it's continuing to use to invest in that broad platform. And that allows it multiple shots on goal in a way that even within the healthcare space, I think is unusual. Um, and so that's why uh, our underlying excitement has really been there. And actually the share price has been bumpy, but if you look at that platform validation, that has actually continued to come through quite nicely. As I said, with flu, RSV mm -hmm. and personalized cancer vaccine. Um, COVID revenues have been obviously a very different sort of state, but actually that broader platform is largely showing the signs that we'd hope it would. Mm. We're just staying on some of the larger holdings. And in this case, NVIDIA, uh, which has appreciated in value uh, recently. How do you think about valuations and the, future up, uh, and the future upside that can be generated from stocks such as NVIDIA, who have seen such huge share price gains this year? Well, NVIDIA makes the chips that are used in artificial intelligence systems. And we've seen the capabilities of those systems expand meaningfully. And the, that's driven um, a huge wave of demand for NVIDIA's um, hardware. And to give you some sense of the scale of that, um, in this quarter, so the third quarter of, of 2022, they did about six billion of revenue. Mm. Um, in the third quarter of 2023, <clears throat> they're talking about doing 16 billion. Um, and so you've had this huge acceleration in what is already a very big business. So this isn't hype about AI. This is real orders, real dollars throwing, flowing through into the business. Um, the way that that I conceptualize this from a valuation standpoint is, you know, we're looking for companies that have a massive opportunity. And then we're thinking about their ability to capitalize on that opportunity. And so 
if a stock price goes up, the questions you need to ask are, has the opportunity got bigger? Has the likelihood of capitalizing on that opportunity increased? Mm -hmm. um, now, if, if you can respond positively to both of those questions, then it may very well be that despite the increase in the, the price of the shares, the valuation hasn't increased. Um, if you look at, at NVIDIA, I, I think it's, you know, we, we've seen very clear evidence that that opportunity has got larger. Um, we've, seen, we've seen evidence that they are able to capitalize on that opportunity. Um, the, the question that's top of my mind is, how are they going to fare against new entrants into this market? Yeah. It is clear that there's huge demand I, I can make a, a convincing case that there's, you know, that that demand picture will look robust for the next decade, um, but our customer is going to buy all that technology from Nvidia, and f for us, we're we're able to answer that that question with a, a fairly confident yes at this point. That's why we're happy to allow this to run to to a large position in the portfolio. Um, linking this back to the earlier question about what we've been doing with our mm. with our time, um, Lawrence was actually in New York three or four weeks ago, um, seeing Jensen Huang, who's the, the founder of NVIDIA. So I don't know if you would, would add anything to that, Lawrence. Yeah, I, I think there'd be two points. Um, one is that the opportunity for AI is broad and large, mm. but it's quite difficult to know what the right applications for it will be and what will be the most successful. Um, but I think the advantage of owning NVIDIA is that you can be somewhat agnostic about the different use cases for AI. But I think, as Tom was saying, with a competitive position, quite confident that whatever the use case of AI, it's highly likely to need to be trained on an NVIDIA chip. So they have about a 90% share of generative AI is trained today uh, using NVIDIA chips. The second one would be that even, and this was what we got from meeting Jensen, even as you move away from all the wonderful possibilities of AI, uh, his case would still be um, there's an ability to disrupt the traditional computing uh, within data centers and to move to what they called accelerated computing, which is really adding in their GPUs uh, to work alongside CPUs. And, you know, when pushing him on that, you know, his view was that that opportunity is a trillion dollars in data centers today. Um, and an awful lot of that would be much better if it shifted to accelerated compute using NVIDIA. And that's the case, even if some of the things that we're hoping about AI don't come to fruition for other general tasks, it would still be useful to make that shift. And I think that starts to get you into the scale of the opportunity that you've got that re-architecting of data centers plus all the additional AI opportunities that often get more of the attention. I suppose AI was a, was a popular topic uh, in, in the questions, but I suppose how are you as fund managers factoring AI into your thinking and how that might translate into returns for the trust? Is, is there a sort of value chain um, of companies that you're thinking about investing in? Well, I think this is, we're, we're pretty early in this. And so yeah. I think we've got to be cautious about, about jumping to conclusions. We've just got to keep learning. Um, now, there are some things that we know already. We, we talked about NVIDIA and we can see the strong position that they have in, in the silicon in this area. Um, you then get into the, the training these, these foundational models. And what we know about that is that it's really expensive. Um, and so there's not many companies that can play in that market, um, that either because they, they don't have the financial wherewithal or the, or the technology background to do it. Um, and so the, the early beneficiaries look to be the large platform technology companies. Mm. Um, we do know that this technology is most likely deployed in the cloud, not in distributed um, in, in distributed fashion. So the big cloud players, the Amazons, the Microsofts of this world look well positioned. Um, and so you know, we, we think about those companies, um, but we're also open-minded to the fact that actually, when you've seen these technology transitions, um, you've seen agile um, new entrants come into, into those markets um, and be able to create long-term um, big growth franchises. We saw that in mobile. We saw that in the transition from desktop to cloud. We saw that from um, and from the growth of internet. So it's it's you know the incumbents will benefit from this. Um, those with deep pockets, um, but being open-minded to to the new entrants as well. Well, you mentioned new entrants. We just actually had a, a question through there on portfolio construction. <laughs> Uh, which is in three parts, uh, what has been the biggest addition, the biggest disposal, and the biggest surprise of the year so far? That's either of you. Um, maybe I'll start on the disposal and you can do the, the more interesting addition. 
Um, I mean, we've talked about this a, a bit before, but um, we have had a reduction in our sort of allocation towards China, and a lot of that's been about raising the bar. Um, and that's meant that we've sold out of a couple of Chinese holdings, and one of the largest there and more long-standing was Alibaba, which was actually our first private investment. Um, and that's really recognizing, I think, a couple of things. Um, the first is that as you try and put those geopolitical risks and domestic regulatory risks into your scenario analysis, you require a corresponding amount of upside to make it worth taking those risks. And so that means that you're sort of raising the bar, and we've done that across the portfolio in relation to our Chinese holdings. And then I think secondly, with Alibaba, we were seeing that um, there were a number of competitive battles that they looked less well-placed than they have been in the past. And I think when you go through those regulatory periods, the um, sort of the culture changes. It becomes one that's more trying to preserve what you have rather than to ambitiously and radically grow and disrupt um, what you don't have. And I think that changes the nature of companies at times. At the same time, you know, we've continued to find companies within China, such as Pinduoduo, where we have added, um, that we think actually are facing a disruptive opportunity, explosive growth, um, you know, they're growing 60% top line revenue. Um, very profitable as well, growing uh, bottom line about 45% year on year. And their valuation um, is a fraction um, in terms of PE multiples, what you'd expect for that kind of growth rate. Um, so hopefully that gives some of the nuances of some of the different trading we've been doing. But you might want to come with some other examples. Um, yeah, I, I think we should mention the, the disposal of Illumina, um, which is a very long standing holding. I think we bought it in May 2015. Um, Maybe, maybe earlier than that, maybe 2011. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, gene sequencing as, as and 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 um, genome sequencing, I think, remains an absolutely critical technology in in healthcare, and one that we we remain absolutely excited about the opportunity for. Um, but the the execution at Illumina in recent years has been disappointing. Um, you've seen management change there, um, but we don't think there are any quick fixes. Mm. Um, and where you know, and at a time where you know you think about edge, um, you you think about competition in those markets and where there are real challenges. Um, you know, I, th I think it's important to accept that where we, where there's ones that just haven't turned out how you hoped. Sell, so move on. Um, perhaps just adding one one more on the addition side. If that's okay. Sure. Um, I, th I think the other side is is you know, going back to your earlier question about sort of holding the same portfolio. You know, we have also made additions and we've found things that we're able to buy at valuations that we haven't been able to access in previous um, years. And so one example would be we've taken a new holding in um, the Korean e-commerce company, Coupang. And that's a company where its share price uh, since its IPO will have fallen something like 60, 70 percent. But actually, if you look at what they've achieved underlying, they've been growing their top line sort of 20 percent year on year. They've moved from unprofitable to sort of on a run rate of de uh, delivering $2 billion of free cash flow a year. Um, and yet, you know, the market isn't really giving much, much time for that. And I think that's indicative of some of the opportunities as well that we're seeing in this environment where you're having companies both that we own and some that we don't own that are executing fundamentally very well, mm -hmm. but are not being rewarded in any way by the market. And as much as we can, we're looking to be opportunistic mm -hmm. around that. Well, we've mentioned Edge and you've mentioned China. We've received a, uh, a question in, in response to China. In your recent notes, now presumably this is in Trust magazine, uh, on your China trip, you reported that CATL uh, appears to be outspending competitors in EV battery R&D. Does this challenge your confidence in Northvolt? So, so I think what is special about Northvolt, and I think the point is absolutely right, that your competition is formidable on the Chinese mm. side. But what's special is, one, as geopolitical tensions increase, it only creates more need for Northvolt, not less. Um, the need for Europe to have its own battery supply chain. Batteries are vital, I think, for the economy, for societies in the 21st century, not just for electric vehicles, but also for um, the grid, dealing with the intermittency of wind and solar energy to store that energy when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining. And I think for, for, for the West and for Europe to have a supply that um, is localised is going to be hugely valuable. That would be, be point one. I think point two would be um, Northvolt are looking at making uh, the battery that is most carbon neutral in terms of how it's produced using hydroelectric power uh, sources in, in northern Sweden. 
and that's also going to give it a battery that isn't just um, local and homegrown and secure supply, but also one that has a lo much lower carbon footprint. And I think those are two structural advantages that Norfolk has as we sort of look out there. Um, and I think in many ways that speaks to the demand that they're seeing, where they've got an order book of $55 billion worth of orders of uh, companies that are wanting them to um, continue to make their batteries from them, from Volkswagen, from Volvo, from a, a range of customers. Mm. And um, we, we, we've received sticking on, on stocks for a while. Why, uh, why do the managers persist uh, to believe that Ocado will actually perform? Is that one for you as well, Lawrence? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so what you see around the world is still relatively low penetration of groceries sold online globally, um, but increasing. And the difficulty is for various supermarkets around the world is how do I deliver those groceries profitably? And that is a difficult challenge, and more so than other areas of commerce, because when you're ordering groceries, you can be ordering 45 items at a time out of a possible uh, 45,000 SKUs. You're wanting them within a few days. You're dealing with items that are heterogeneous, that have to be controlled in different temperature um, zones, um, and need to sort of arrive unspilled, unbruised, and all of those factors that make it a very difficult logistical challenge. And for Ocado, they've developed over the last 20 years a technology that can do that um, profitably. And when we speak to the customers that have signed up Ocado around the world, um, you know, what we get back is this was basically the only system out there that actually was working live and could show us um, sort of data points that would work. And so you've seen many, many supermarkets partner with them. Now, it is an investment case that requires patience. Um, because there's a lot of upfront costs. As you build each of the facilities and build out your robotics, that requires capital. Um, but once these facilities mature overseas, um, the margin profile becomes very attractive and you should see them being very profitable. And I think the other element here is that what we're looking for in Scottish mortgage is companies that have a chance of potentially delivering a very large multiple of return. Grocery is a multi-trillion dollar market. Mm. If Ocado execute this and get this right, um, they can be a, a much, much more valuable company. And so it really has that right tail that often attracts us. Well, the mention of Northfolt uh, has prompted some questions on, on privates and Tom, particularly on um, really when the, we might expect to see some activity come back to the IPO market. So there was a, uh, an article in the Financial Times, I think it was last week, uh, regarding um, a potential IPO for Northvolt. So do you have a reasonable idea of when a, a Northvolt, a SpaceX, or some of the other component parts might IPO? Um, no, is the, is the short answer. <laughs> um, we couldn't, you, know, the, you had that, that period through the first half of 2022 when the market was in free fall. Mm -hmm. And I think ev everybody sort of froze at that point. Maybe people are, are waiting to see what's going to happen. Um, and then in this, it, you, you've had a period through the second half of 22 and into 23 where um, you've had relative calm. You know, the, the, it's, not been a, it's not been a strong market, but you haven't seen that type of um, disconcerting, um, you know, rapid declines. Um, and so we went through, through a period where there was no IPO activity. There was just no capital markets activity at all. Um, and then in, through into the, the autumn of 23, you started to see some activity return. You know, these, these were companies that have been talking about going public for a while. Um, you know, they'd just been waiting for opportunity. And, and actually, you've, you've seen some of those transactions happen. So I would, I would classify that as green shoots. Yeah. Um, but, you know, for a sort of more wholesale move to, to, to a more regular IPO market, it's it's dependent on so many variables and, and so dependent on confidence that you can't say. Mm. I think that um, for, for Scottish Mortgage and, and for our holdings, what's most important though is, are these companies executing, delivering on that opportunity? Mm. Um, because for companies that are performing well, um, you know, they will at some point be able to access capital markets and list. Mm. Um, and you know, we have a pool of permanent capital, it doesn't really matter to us when that happens. The constraint comes if we're close to or over the limit when we can't deploy new capital into privates if there is a, if there is a big stream of new opportunities. Well, I suppose just, just on that point, if memory serves, when we sat down six months ago, the, the, the idea of, the, of raising the 30, or asking shareholders to raise the 30% limit 
uh, was discussed. And, and I think we'd said that we might come back to shareholders um, uh, you know, about, about raising that limit. Do, does does the, um, the, the, the continued low level of activity in the IPO market make it more likely that we will come back to shareholders? No, there's no change in that. Um, if we felt that shareholders were missing out because of this limit, then mm. we'd go and talk to shareholders about it. But um, we don't feel like there's many transactions that we're missing out on. Um, we've been continuing to deploy some capital into our existing holdings through the, the first half of the company's year. Um, so you know, it's, it, it, it is a constraint that bites at times, but it's not something that is causing us as headaches. So okay. um, if it is, then, then we would start that conversation. Yeah. Well, the mention of SpaceX uh, has uh, attracted a couple of questions. Um, I think it can be most easily summed up in, could, you, could, uh, could one of you share the investment case for SpaceX? Should I, should I take that and keep going? Um, well, as, as it stands today, um, I, I think the first part is around the launch market. Mm-hmm. Um, and what you've seen is that... Um, this is this is a this is a very big market, very big potential market, with rapidly growing demand, um, and at the same time, um, most of SpaceX's competition has been struggling. Um, you know, geopolitics makes Russian launch launches unattractive to Western companies. Um, others that have you know other programs are coming to a natural end. Um, their replacements aren't being launched, so so we've we've seen SpaceX move to from being one of the options to being almost the only option of any yeah. scale in the commercial launch market. Um, and when you have a massive market share of a of a market with growing demand, that's that's a, often a very attractive position. Um, the 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 next piece is around um, Starlink, which is the satellite internet service, um, and there, huge market, trillion dollar plus market. Yeah. Um, they they have the ability to serve customers who are very poorly served by existing technologies, so that allows them to gain real scale where there is no competition. Um, but also the nature of the technology allows them to compete very effectively with with people who are providing internet access mm-hmm. with other approaches. And so that whole trillion dollar market is accessible to them. Um, and again, nobody nobody else can really do this. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, SpaceX is the only real viable at scale launch provider, um, and they're using that capacity and certainly any ex- excess capacity in that service to launch Starlink satellites. Um, and so again, huge market share um, in in you know um, low Earth orbit um, internet provision. So you know, those are the first two opportunities, um, but there are lots of other opportunities that that flow from that. So it's really a company we're very excited about. Okay. Well, moving on from companies, we're, we're, we're getting a few questions in around interest rates and, and, and inflation. So, Lawrence, perhaps one for you. If interest rates stay higher for longer, this is typically a headwind for growth companies. What are you doing to prepare for this? Will you tilt your style at all? I think it's really important to be clear about where your edge is and to stay within your philosophical bucket and where your edge is. So we're not adapting our philosophy around that. At the same time, you need to be aware about sort of the, the broader shifts and what's going on. Mm. And what I think we've really seen is that you've seen quite a lot of adaption at the company level uh, to some of those changes, particularly in the availability of capital. And so if you look through the portfolio, we've had a number of companies that have swing from sort of making losses because capital was cheap and they could continue to reinvest in yeah. the business to saying, well, we recognise the financial conditions have changed and they've moved very quickly to those. And they've quite pleasingly been able to sort of swing to profitability quite strongly. Um, and I think it's those adaptations we've been focusing on monitoring um, th- that are really driving some of that underlying change. Um, so to give you one example around that, um, we invest in a Latin American e-commerce and finance company called Macar Libre. Mm-hmm. Again, it's a company that's actually executed really well over the last few years. They're growing revenues in US dollars, 30 to 50% year on year. They've gone from break even though to a 16% operating margin last quarter in the last couple of years. And, and that's kind of what you're starting to see as companies are reacting to, I think, the changes in the financial conditions. And it's been pleasing to see. I think, I think, the, um, I think Lawrence is, is absolutely right. You know, you've seen this. If, if you look at the, the only the listed portion of the portfolio, mm. We've seen the free cash flow 
generation double yeah. with largely the same portfolio from from the first half of uh, for, for for the year to the end of June 23 it doubled versus the year to, to the end of June 22 so you've you've seen that um, that growth in free cash flow um, that that is just adaptation I think that you you know what what you also see and it's it's around the sort of companies is think about you know making sure they have access to capital you know that the you know you, it's it's not a given mm-hmm. um you, you you know you need to be executing and actually that ability to to access capital is really important so you know and take an example like aurora innovation which do um which 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 are building a um a a driver for trucks so a, a self-driving mechanism for, for for trucks um that's that business is pre-revenue um but in the summer they were able to go out and raise a large amount of capital despite the environment, which I think speaks to what, they, what they've been able to achieve from a technology standpoint that makes them robust to these changing financial circumstances, even when they, when they aren't generating profits. Um, and, and with that one, um, just to flag that Aurora is in, 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 and the CEO founder of Aurora, Chris Emerson, is the, is, is the first speaker on the, on our new season of our podcast. Um, which I, which... Tom, Tom, you get a gold star for that. Uh, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was going to mention that at the end. Uh, 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 yes, our pod, uh, season two of the pod, uh, the podcast, Invest in Progress, uh, launched yesterday, yep. uh, and it is and it isn't and it is indeed the the, the first episode. Um, I want to ask you also. So, so just just be, just before you yeah, move yeah, on, please, the, please. The, the, I, I just want I just think we should be we, we should be really clear about this though. Um, we don't think you can make um, successful predictions about what's going to happen in a complex system like the global economy. Yeah. We don't know what's going to happen to interest rates, mm-hmm. um, but we aren't changing what we do because of what's happening in interest mm-hmm. rates. Um, you know, the, you know, yes, a higher cost of capital um, is, is challenging for companies everywhere. You know, the, the, um, I, th- I think Warren Buffett said mm-hmm. that um, interest rates are like uh, gravity um, for stock markets. You know, we wouldn't, wouldn't deny any of those challenges, but we believe that the the value created by a small number of exceptional companies over the long run mm-hmm. is is the way to make money, and yep. and that's ir- irrespective of the economic conditions, irrespective of interest rates. Well, the um, I suppose uh, for underlying shareholders, one way to potentially uh, make money would be to buy the trust on a discount. So uh, we've we've been asked a question about that. Um, if the discount is near twi- is near twenty percent, I'm paying eighty pence for a pound's worth of assets. What's the catch? Um, there is no catch. I mean, that's yeah. the you know the. I, I think we own some of the most attractive growth companies in the world. We're at a period in markets where there's a lot of fear. There aren't a lot of new buyers for our shares, um, and that drives the discount. Um, but the, you know, the, 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 it, the it's, it, it is both that we, you, you trade at a discount to the net asset value. The, the investment trust structure also gives you gearing into markets so that you know, when you start to see in markets rising, or the, the companies that we own rising, that you get that geared benefit as well as the, the, the opportunity and the discount. Um, you know, we're recognizing that by buying back shares, mm-hmm. buying back our own shares, which we think we can do at an attractive price. Um, I've, I've been buying the shares as well. I, I, there's just, there isn't a catch. <laughs> uh, good, um, I'm, uh, good. Uh, I'm glad on that. Um, going back to private companies, um, it's, you know, uh, the question's been asked about how these, um, how private companies are adapting to the new funding environment? Well, I think that the absolutely critical piece mm-hmm. um, for a private company, if they want to access funding, is accepting the new reality. Private companies don't have to do that, of course. Yeah. Um, you know, their shares don't trade every day. There, you know, you can structure the way that you you access finance, um, but but if you want to do a price round, you know, actually find a price for your business, then you just have to be realistic about the environment in which you're operating. You know, it, it's not 2021 anymore, mm-hmm. um, and where companies have done that, they've been able to access very significant amounts of capital, 
Um, Stripe was an example of that earlier in the year where um, they, they did a transaction running into billions of dollars um, and it was at a significantly lower valuation than, than they'd had in 2021. Um, but the stock market is significantly lower. If you if you know if your listed peers are trading, you know at a, at a big discount to previous prices, why should you expect to have previous prices? Um, so it is a more difficult environment. Yeah. Um, but for the companies that are executing, and that's not all of them mm-hmm. across the market in our portfolio. Yeah. Um, but but funds that are the, the capital is there, um, as long as you're realistic about price. Mm. Uh, we, we have some question. Uh, we've had a question in a, about valuations. Just going back to one of the early questions, and it says you don't care about valuations. How do you respond to that, Lawrence? I think again, you can be an investor and not care about valuations. I think it's about how you think about them that's different. Yeah. Um, and so what we're thinking about is not a spot multiple of earnings. So, so a spot multiple doesn't tell you if a company is expensive or cheap on its own. The way we go about it is we think, firstly, over our time horizon. So thinking what happens to these companies over five and 10 years. Um, and that's the way we think about value. So your starting point today is a certain valuation. What do we think the uh, revenues, the profits, and the market will pay for that in five or 10 years time? And that's what guides us. The other point along with time horizon becomes that there isn't uh, the way we see it sort of one possible scenario. There are multiple scenarios. And so we will build out what would be called a base case, which we think might be the most likely, uh, a ball case, which would be optimistic, uh, a blue sky, which would be very optimistic, but unlikely, and, and also the negative scenarios, and consider the entire spectrum of those possibilities on a five to 10 year time horizon. And, and that's really what ends up informing, you know, is this stock attractive at these valuations levels or not? And sometimes you do that and you go, Actually, on a probability weighted basis, this looks attractive, and I can see scenarios where you could make potentially um, five times your money. And other times, we we get a bit disappointed that we get excited about a company, we go through that process, and it turns out that even though we think it's a great company, it's a little bit hard to see how you make that pathway to earning multiples of upside. So, valuation, the starting point of what you're, sure you're investing in, um, you know, really does matter but it has to be seen through a time horizon um, and through a probabilistic nature. Maybe to, to pick up on the, the, you know, valuations don't matter. You know, the, the bit of valuations that we, that we don't think about, that we don't think add value, is that you know, so many people focus on what is the, the ratio between the price of this company and its earnings. Um, and, and they look at earnings for this year. So if the, is if this company is valued at twenty times this year's earnings, another one is valued at thirty times this year's earnings, another one is valued at forty times this year's earnings. We don't think you can look at those numbers and say anything useful about what the share price is going to do in the next five years. Mm. If if one stock starts on twenty times earnings and another starts on forty times earnings, there's no evidence that the one that's on twenty times earnings is going to do better than the one that's on forty times earnings. Mm. It just depends what happens to the earnings over the next five years, and that's where we focus our efforts not on whether it's on 20 times or 40 times to start. Well, and add to that and say that actually, if you go back over the things that have driven Scottish mortgages' performance over the long term, you'll find that when we first bought them, they will all have been at a high multiple and have actually added the most value over time. Um, because in some ways, what you are looking for is a company that has a very large growth opportunity and has that potential to grow earnings. Mm. Um, and, and so that, that large multiple... Um, if you can get it for less, it's great, but, but often it comes with that. But if you're looking for a company that can grow exponentially, you can quite quickly wear down that multiple, as you quietly say, with the earnings. So if we, if, if we think about the valuations or the future valuations that you're attributing to some of the private names, given how some of the tech companies like an Arm or, or Instacart uh, have performed following the recent IPOs, have you made any changes to the way that you're valuing private companies? Um, so... You, you've had these, for example, Instacart or Arm mm. list on the stock market, um, and then you know the, how they've performed subsequently in a weak market. I just don't think there's a lot of information in that. Mm. You know, you, you, stock prices will do what stock prices will do over short periods of time. Recently IPO'd companies tend to be more volatile than the broader market. Mm. Um, but in terms of what it means for valuations in our portfolio, the first thing to say is, Lawrence and I have nothing to do with those valuations, so so it, um, you know that they're done first independently by a third party. It's a separate um, group within Bailey Gifford. They're overseen by the board. They're audited externally. 
that the inputs those groups look at are what are the listed peers doing? What what are their stock prices done? What are their what are their valuations? And that process feeds how we value the privates. Mm -hmm. um, and so that of course takes into account market data, market training. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I don't think there's much that can be inferred from the, the performance of a of a small handful of recent IPOs. And and with with the team that does it that isn't me on Tom, it's also worth remembering that I think in the year uh, to the end of the financial year, March 2023, they did about 530 revaluations of the private companies. And I think in the last six months, they've done sort of closer to the 800. Um, but that gives you an idea of sort of the responsiveness of um, you know, adapting it to some of the listed peers over time that they're, they're doing. And it's fair to say that the, many of the private names have been written down yes. it, 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 in, in the portfolio and, um, you know, um, materially. So, so um, but just, I think maybe, yeah. maybe if I'm, I may yeah. on this, um, you know, the, I think people have and, and shareholders rightly have wanted to scrutinise the way that that we value these private assets. Yeah. Um, and that you know the you know if if the market wants to apply a discount to our shares, mm -hmm. you know, in, in its assessment of those assets, then then that's for the market to decide. But what I believe is that we own some fantastic businesses in private markets mm -hmm. and they are going to be a big source of value creation for our shareholders over the coming years. You know, we see these businesses executing against big opportunities. And you know, the I we we just need to get away slightly from this, you know, focusing on worrying about valuations or thinking things that are illiquid are automatically bad. Mm -hmm. You know, these are some phenomenal businesses. Mm -hmm. And and Getting access to them at a low cost for our shareholders is, I, I think, one of the distinctive and important attributes of, of Scottish mortgage. I suppose private companies is perhaps one of the reasons that the that the rating of the company, so, this, so of Scottish mortgage, the discount has remained um, so so wide. But why do you think it's remained remained so wide for so long? Um, I I. I think that the you, you've got a, a market-wide issue with the investment trust sector at the moment. Just about every investment trust sector is on uh, investment trust is on a discount. Um, I you know I, I think there's a lot of nervousness out there about about the economy. Um, you're seeing a response yep. to what's happening to interest rates, and all of these things are, are variables that each on their own are very hard to predict. So thinking that you can sort of predict in in the aggregate is um, in, in in my mind wishful thinking. Um, so, you know, I, yes, I think there is, there has been a concern about private, um, company valuations and we, we, it was really important that we get out there and make, demonstrate to people that this process robust, show people the results of that process, show that we've factored market valuations into the, the way we, we value our private companies. Um, but, but, you know, I, I, I think that ultimately you need confidence more broadly to return to, to address some of those, those discount issues. Good. The, uh, well, coming on to the last few questions, there's a good, there's a good one here, and, it, and it's for both of you. What holding are each of you most excited about on a five to ten year time horizon? <laughs> Give me more time to think. <laughs> there's too many to choose from. Um, no, I think that's I think that's right. Um, where would you start? So, you know, I, I think the, the the first point to make is that our largest holdings reflect our biggest enthusiasms. Um, you know, we've we've touched on some of them on on Medina, on Nvidia, mm -hmm. um, you know, Amazon, Tesla. You know, th these are businesses which we think have phenomenal opportunities that are enhanced by what's happening in AI, etc. Um, I think just you know, just for more for sort of shining a spotlight on some of the other areas of the portfolio or some of the new areas of the portfolio, um, we took a holding in a company called Oddity in in the, in the mm -hmm. past six months. Um, this is a direct to consumer makeup business or makeup and skincare business. Um, a, the, you know, this is a, a beauty and skincare is a massive category. Uh, there's been no real online players. You've seen, you know, some of the existing players move to some some online sales, but actually doing this with an online only model is is a completely different mm -hmm. um, business. Their lead brand is Il Maquillage, um, grown to be a, a pretty large brand in a very short space of time. Um, they have a second brand, Spoiled Child, which has grown even more rapidly. Um, and this is a, a technology-first business uh, that understands the internet, that understands the different model of, of sales that you need. 
um, and going after a huge marketplace. So maybe just one that shareholders haven't really heard about that's new to the portfolio that's, that's yeah. really exciting. I mean, I think to answer it straight in many ways, it, it would actually be the private holdings that we've been touching on. It would be yep. SpaceX and Norfolk. Um, and, and the reason for that is, is one, they both face tremendously large opportunities and um, have unusually strong competitive advantages. But, but secondly, for my own personal investments, I mean, there's no other way to access those companies um, as an individual, for me at least, mm -hmm. other than to do it through Scottish Mortgage. And so I think to be able to access those to me is, is, is phenomenal. Um, we've spent a lot of the last uh, six or 12 months sort of almost on the defensive about the private companies in terms of, you know, is the valuation uh, done appropriately? Um, do they have access to capital? But actually, it's the private holdings that are showing some of the best operational data that, uh, by far that we have mm. and do have access to capital. And, uh, you know, SpaceX's opportunity is huge as they sort of take the cost down from accessing space by 90 percent. So I think some of those larger private holdings where you're seeing that incredible operational performance of, of really, really attractive um, and uh, fascinating to continue to learn about. Mm. There's a question that, that, that continues. Uh, to be asked uh, quite, a, quite a few times, have either of you increased your personal holding in Scottish Mortgage recently? Yes. Yes. There we go. That's, he was being asked lots of times, so I thought I could. <laughs> well. Then I think we should move to, to, to um, a final question, and it is, what is the question you hope is not asked of you today? That will relate to the Scottish Mortgage portfolio. <laughs> <laughs> You're not getting over it that quickly. Um, well, <laughs> we, we we were talking when, when you and I see it. We're talking about um, this uh, this 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 session earlier. You you said you said to me, um, what somebody suggested asking how we were feeling. Yes, I, I'm. I've been very glad that you haven't asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Um, um, just just because I I. You know, I, I don't think really feelings come into it very much. Um, that you know that that you know, we we have a clear um, philosophy around how we select our investments, how we hold our investments. Um, we have a clear process which we which we execute in a fairly clinical and dispassionate way about thinking about opportunity and likelihood of capitalizing. Mm -hmm. um, and you know it, it, it. You know it's it's not a very emotional process. So uh, <laughs> how I feel about it really doesn't come into it. So I'm I'm pretty glad you didn't ask me how I was feeling. Nevertheless, you've kind of answered that question. Well done. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. I, I assumed they had to answer that. Yeah, yeah. Didn't want to, no, to no, no, Lawrence, you've had a bit of time to think. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think we were trying to be open. I mean. Uh, I think it can sometimes, if you go back to the private companies' valuations ones, those ones are interesting because it's not us doing them. And so you yeah. can get quite a lot of detailed questions on them, whereas, you know, it, it's sort of, it's a separate team that are doing those valuations and, and you, yeah. you don't interfere. Um, but at the same time, you have to be able to sort of talk about them in some detail, even though it's not your day-to-day your -day job. Yeah, fair enough. Well, Tom Lawrence, thank you very much uh, for your time today. And thank you for everybody uh, at home. I can say that this session has been recorded and will be available on the website with a transcript soon. Now, before we go, before we go, one thing that I, I should mention again, uh, Tom, is that the second season of the Scottish Mortgage podcast uh, um, Invest in Progress launched yesterday. A QR code should be showing on your screen now if you'd like to have a listen. And if you're signed up to our emails, uh, you probably already uh, got this. Uh, got the news about the podcast, and if you're not signed up on our on our emails, uh, you can do so on the uh, homepage of the website. So thank you very much for joining us and your ongoing support. Goodbye.